Access to capital and investment in innovation are needed to accelerate the development of Alzheimer's treatments. Our next panel will discuss impactful therapies that can be made possible when scientists, entrepreneurs, and leaders connect in the name of science. Welcome Russ Paulson, Chief Operating Officer of Us Against Alzheimer's. Thanks for joining us for our last panel of the summit. Yesterday, our kickoff panel was about where are drugs today? What's coming in the pipeline right now? What's coming in the very near future? But as we've learned through the summit, all of us have a part to play. And one part of this ecosystem of getting to an end to Alzheimer's involves private funding. We heard a uh, representative from the National Institute on Aging yesterday. We've heard from one government leader yesterday. We'll hear from another one after this panel. But there's private funding as well. And there's private funding at various stages, including early in the, in the disease. So we want to talk about where science and private money intersect. With me today are people whose bios could take me the entire 45 minutes to read in, in, in thoroughness but I'm gonna give you the high, high points for each of them. Uh, Professor Dr. Philip Shelton's is managing partner of LSP Dementia Fund. He is a neurologist, professor of cognitive neurology, founder of the Alzheimer's Center Amsterdam at the University of Medical Center Amsterdam. Philip is a leading global opinion leader in Alzheimer's. He's published, a lot of zeros out for this one, folks, over 1,100 publications in peer reviewed journals. Dr. Laura Neisenbaum is Executive Director of Drug Development at the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation, ADDF. A neuroscientist by training, Laura has contributed to advancing more than 35 compounds through drug discovery and development, including taking molecules from preclinical discovery into clinical trials, taking them through clinical trials, and bringing three molecules to the FDA. She's also offered, uh, authored 35 publications in peer-reviewed scientific journals. And finally, uh, my friend and colleague at ADDF, Mark Reuthmeyer, the CEO, has helped increase their revenue threefold since he's been there, previously Chief Relationship Officer at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, previously President of Autism Speaks, and also National Leadership Positions at the March of Dimes. So this is about the intersection of, of money and drugs, and I think it's helpful to understand sort of how you know, when we were kids, we all learned about how a bill becomes a law. How does a target become a medicine for us? And the person who sort of worked across that the most, I think, is Laura. So we'll start with you, Laura. How, how does a, a, a target become a, a molecule, become a drug, become a medicine? What are the big steps? And, and who finds yeah. that? Yeah. Russ, that's a really great question. And it's... Um, it's really difficult to learn about that. So, um, you know, it's hard to believe, but our medicines take well over a decade to come from our initial idea and discovery up through the potential for being a medicine. So on average, a, a molecule can take from an initial discovery idea, um, you know, 12 to 15 years, but well over that as well. And the number, that needs to um, be prosecuted through that pipeline is really vast. From an initial idea, um, when we're trying to identify molecules, it takes well over 10,000 compounds or substances to make their way through the um, discovery and clinical development pipeline to be one that um, can possibly make it into a medicine. So from the discovery side, before we even make it into uh, clinical testing, um, can be five to seven to 10 years. And then just in the clinical development path, that can take you know, six to eight years itself. So this is something that really starts in academia where we can, um, try to understand what genes are important, what proteins are important. And so then from the ideas, that information can flow into smaller biotechs or into pharma. And there needs to be funding um, from governments to help with academics, 
but also then um, in from private funding as well. And this takes us into our biotech companies who can begin to understand how molecules behave in animals and in humans. Um, and then we need that those big players to help get beyond the early stage clinical trials. So the phase one, phase two, um, and once there's some confidence in those molecules, they then need to go in very large clinical trials with hundreds to thousands of um, patients to be tested to see that the molecules are safe and efficacious. And this takes well over hundreds of millions of dollars for any compound to make it all the way into a medicine. It's estimated that it's well over $2 billion for that single single medicine to make it to market. So we really do need to combine um, both the scientific expertise across the different ecosystems, as well as the financial wherewithal to bring those molecules all the way through those late stage clinical trials. Thank you. That's daunting. So Philip, you a couple of years ago left what for any of the early career folks on this call, early career researchers would look at as probably a dream job in academic medicine at Amsterdam. And you decided to be one of the people who tried to pick one of the 10,000, you, you, the one in 10,000 that Laura talked about. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, and it's a big shift. Uh, tell me why, why now, why this shift and why now? Um, so the shift is indeed quite, quite, uh, quite huge, uh, but it's also logical. I mean, I've spent 30 years or even more of my academic life uh, finding biomarkers to define the diseases in living persons. So when I started my career, the only diagnosis was uh, after death or post-mortem. And that is of course, totally unsatisfactory and also not very useful for drug development. So I started my career working in biomarkers, trying to define the disease in vivo uh, in order to make an accurate diagnosis about the brain pathology present in patients who present with a form of dementia. And uh, I've done that for a long time, and I think we have been successful. The, the field has really, really sort of advanced in the sense that we are now making molecular diagnosis by using scans, by using blood tests even, or CSF tests. And that is the starting point for developing rationale therapies. And so I thought, well, I can stay in academia and try to do my bit in drug development. I've did that all my life and did, uh, did uh, drug trials, but to develop molecules and to help them getting from phase one, phase two, phase two, phase three, as Laura indicated, that's actually what is needed is money. So I looked at the oncology field and where the progress has been made by venture capital, putting into the biotech, as Laura indicated, and making them progress until uh, sort of a further stage, a next stage. And this was totally lacking in the field of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and I think we cannot rely only on big pharma to develop drugs. Actually, uh, they have uh, for a big part left basic research or fundamental research in that part and just are scoping around the world looking for biotech and we are there to help them and we are there to to look for the good companies that develop drugs in a proper way and I thought it would be my task to put all my scientific uh, knowledge and experience into that part. So indeed, two years ago, I gradually moved into this new role and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's about science, but it's also combining science and money and put your money where the science is and to do a good job. So what, why now? No, why now? Uh, I, th I think the timing is right uh, in my career. It's it's now, but also the timing in, in the drug development is right. I mean, uh, we used to say, we, we're saying that the neurodegenerative space or Alzheimer's disease and all the other dementias is now where oncology was 10, 15 years ago. So it's now actually the moment we have the biomarkers, we have the right tools, we can actually pre-diagnose people already in a preclinical phase. That is exactly the moment that we have to start developing better drugs. <clears throat> so flash forward 10 years from now, what does success yeah. look like for you in this movie? <clears throat> yeah, that's a very good question. Coincidentally, our fund also, the usually uh, most of the VC funds have a lifetime of 10 years, so that's actually appropriate. So within that 10 years, I hope to be uh, uh, the witness of at least a couple of the companies that we are uh, have invested in and we are monitoring them and we have an active board seat and there will be more to come that uh, a few of them will really have 
developed drugs and, and went from phase one to phase two or from phase two to phase three, for instance, to be really saying, well, we did the job well, we chose the right candidates and we chose the right population to study it in and see here, we can actually offer this to the pharma to develop it in larger phase three trials. As Laura indicated, those are the last part, the most important part, but also the most expensive part. And that's usually only done by pharma, but the whole, the whole path before that can be done by VC together with the biotech. Thanks. So, so Mark, EDF <clears throat> is a little bit like the fund that Philip is now leading, but it's a it's a not just a classic private for-profit venture philanthropy capital, it's venture philanthropy. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And how does that enable you to, or does it enable you to take a different role in the ecosystem? Yeah, it completely. And and first of all, Russ and, and everyone with us against Alzheimer's, thanks for having us here today. And uh Terrific, terrific panel to be on. So, you know, just very simply, venture philanthropy, instead of giving out grants to academic institutions or biotechs, we give out contracts. So if we're going to give a million dollars to an academic institution to study a particular molecule or a million dollars to a biotech, it comes with a contract. And that contract says if that institution down the road sees any kind of deal flow, right, gets any kind of positive grip with that molecule whereby they are making money off of it, a percentage of that money comes back to ADDF. The ADDF has to immediately put that back into the science. That's how we keep our 501c3 or nonprofit status. The niche that's been carved out here for ADDF and particularly in neuroscience and particularly in Alzheimer's, it's quite critical. Uh, ADDF was founded by the Lauder family as an Estee Lauder left a uh, trust to her two sons, Leonard and Ronald, and said, do something about Alzheimer's. This was an important issue to their family. As you can imagine, folks like the Lauder family, they kind of scoured the earth for the best and brightest minds of what to do. So actually about 24 years ago, somebody at the NIA said to them, you know, we're going to keep bringing a lot of money for the basic science of Alzheimer's, right? The brain is the last frontier. But even 24 years ago, they said, we're knowing enough about the brain now that somebody needs to take, start taking shots on goal. What that literally meant that somebody, instead of just, wow, this is an interesting insight in the lab, let's write a paper on it. So we even move that interesting insight in the lab into the drug development process, preclinical, phase one safety, phase two target engagement, phase three pharma comes in and takes it across the finish line. So in this kind of unique way, ADDF had about a, a quarter century start on this. And I'll point out one or two seminal moments in that journey. One was about 10 years ago when pharma came into the amyloid theory, right? And pharma said, hey, there might be something to this. We'd like to take it across the finish line. So ADDF at that time stopped funding anything to do with amyloid because our view was we got it to where it needs to be into the hands of pharma. But 10 years ago, the organization decided, and this was through Dr. Howard Phillip and the board, where is the light night shining? What else do we need to take a look at? And at that time, Howard, it, it's a well-known phrase now, it's called the biology of aging. As we're all on this panel, we're all aging, we all age differently. Genetics has something to do with it, metabolism, inflammation, vascular, they all have different things to do with it. So there's about seven or eight pathways. And ADF started putting all their money into those seven or eight pathways, right? And funding what's called, and, and uh, Philip knows this, Laura knows this, what industry calls the valley of death, where good ideas go to die because the academics get it so far, but pharma is way out here saying, we're not touching unless it's de-risked, right? And what ADDF is funds this risky, what's considered risky, innovative science. And we today are the largest, most diverse funder of clinical trials in the world. We don't put the most money in, as we heard one drug could take a billion to $2 billion, but we're funding 35 different trials across this spectrum of biology of aging. Most are phase 2A studies that we're doing right now. So this is very unique niche. Where is the risk? 
How can we take that risk and innovation, de-risk it and move it along so we can ultimately get to patients? So Phil, I was really stuck with something that Laura said at the beginning, one in 10,000 compounds make it. And we know in Alzheimer's, I'm not even sure it's been one in 10,000. We've had so long since there was a, a victory in Alzheimer's. Your job is, I mean, you don't have the sort of the, the marching orders from the founders of a, of a nonprofit like Mark has. Your job is to make money for the investors. How do you pick? How do you say this is the one that I think is going to be the gold rush? Yeah, that's a very good question that I can't answer because it's 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 a question of uh, sort of so just to give an example of how we work. So we see, I think, a new company every day uh, sends us a deck and, and slides, and they have an idea and they have worked on it already. They have some animal work done, or even even before that, or or some later work. And then we just well, we do, we do two things. We look at the science behind it and we look is this a good target uh, is the work that we have done is this scientifically solid uh etc cetera, etc cetera. so is is there indeed a, a niche for this and is there an indeed and an, a sort of a, a, a sort of a part in 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 the sort of where this drug would actually fill in and then the second part is the team i've come to learn also in this job that the team is as important as the science itself so the people handling this company the ceo the cso the cfo everybody involved is is crucial they have to be high quality also experienced in that in that job and so we weigh these two things together and it's a very difficult job i can tell you because we can only invest i think in one percent of the deals that we see so we have to reject 99 percent, and we do this on the basis of also not good science or not good team or just not a perfect fit for our fund because we can only sort of we have a particular stage sort of as you just heard i mean we're all in this in this sort of from a from an early very very early discovery you need seed money we don't do that but if you have seed money and you brought the compound towards some of the animal experience experiments and you want to think about the first in human study that's exactly where we can come in and there are also companies that come to us for with phase 2b programs but, but they are much too expensive so there's a lot of lot of things that come into the mix before we ultimately decide to fund a particular company so laura I, I noticed in your bio you've taken three compounds to the fda so you've had in and i know your last job before you joined addf was with, <clears throat> with, with biogen a big company that's got a lot of investments in neuroscience including an alzheimer's drug take us into the mind of pharma as they look at these compounds and they're trying to pick they and and their bet is huge as as you and, and philip have said their their bet is enormous how do they decide that there's probably not a 10,000 anymore that they're they're picking from people from concepts that have been sort of weeded down somewhere in the funnel but they're still having to make choices how, can you take us into the mind of, of the pharmaceutical acquisition team to, to business development teams to figure out how do they they make their choices sure that's a great question russ and i'll um you know loop back to something that Mark brought up, which is that valley of death. Um, and oftentimes the reason that compounds don't make it out of that valley of death and, and you know, the pharma, what they're looking for are which molecules have been de-risked enough to provide evidence showing that they have the potential to reach the criteria that will be necessary to move something into those later stage trials. So some of the things that they look at are all of the thing, all of the things that we've been talking about. Is there target engagement? So does the compound that's being studied make it to the target where it's supposed to act? Um, and does this have some type of pharmaco pharmacodynamic meaning is there some proof of mechanism that that substance is doing what it's supposed to be doing? That doesn't necessarily mean clinical efficacy because in early stage trials, there oftentimes is not sufficient um, uh, number of subjects in these trials to be able to see a, a real clinically meaningful change, but there needs to be a connection between the mechanism of the drug in being studied 
and what should happen in the brain. So ideally, um, now that we do have some molecules that are beginning to show some clinical signals, um, so the data that was uh, just shared by ASI with lecanemab, that amyloid compound now has shown that there is some change in clinical signal. We can use that to try to understand the biomarkers that are correlated or associated with that change in clinical signal. So from a pharma perspective, ideally what you want to see is what's called a connected flow scheme in the discovery phase, meaning you know, your compound hits the target that you think it's supposed to hit, it shows some type of mechanistic change in the pathology of the disease. And then ideally there would be some link, some reason to believe that that change in pathology would then cause a change in clinically meaningful um, outcome for the patients. So from a pharma perspective, that's the ideal. But we know that there are very few compounds early on that are going to have all of those boxes checked. So um, there needs to be some signal. And oftentimes, the way that you can get um, greater confidence is when multiple signals are moving in the right direction. So that might be multiple biomarkers. You know, have you identified the right population? Have you identified the right pathology? And can you show some movement in that pathology that there's reason to believe that there would be some meaningful change for the patients? So Phil, back to you for a sort of a, a question following up. So the, the, the things that you and Laura just identified as like the hurdles to getting a medicine to patients are gonna be common across all of the diseases that we've got in the world. But Alzheimer's has been really a tough nut to crack. We haven't had a drug in 20 years. We are, as you said earlier, 10 to 15 years behind cancer, maybe. Why? Why is Alzheimer's so hard? Well, it's 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 it is indeed hard. Uh, I must also say, I mean, we haven't tried that long. I mean, compared to cancer, our field is relatively very young. And, and the recent advances in all these biomarkers are still actually from this age. So, so it's in 2004, we have amyloid PET scan that usually changed the, so the, whole, the whole landscape. So that's relatively uh, a short time ago. But I would say the brain is really very well equipped to protect itself uh, against the drugs from the outside world, having the blood-brain barrier. So it's quite difficult, first of all, to, to make an accurate diagnosis in the brain itself. What kind of disease is there? Now we have the biomarker. And second is, how do we get a drug there that actually works in, in enough quantity? And can we measure the effect? So there's a lot of things that are much easier to do in the heart or the liver or any other organ than it is in the brain. And then on top of that, uh, Alzheimer's is a, more, is a, a multifactorial disease. I mean, amyloid is very important, but also tau is important. And also other proteinopathies are important. Aging plays a role, vasculature, vascular changes play a role. So there is not a, a single target that would actually would give you the ultimate resolution of Alzheimer's disease. You have to probably target many of those. So we, we have just started. I would say lecanemab, aducanemab, these are the first signs that the approach that we are now taking to drug development is actually working. It's much better than we did before. I mean, remember the cholinesterase inhibitors were developed for patients that we really didn't have a clue what they had. We just made a clinical diagnosis, but half of them, they didn't have Alzheimer's disease probably. So we have really sort of changed the, the paradigm by using the biomarkers and going earlier in the disease. And this has to evolve in the next steps after the, the monoclonal antibodies into many, many other drugs focusing and targeting all, all the other aspects of Alzheimer's disease. But we'll get there. I love to hear that. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure every patient who's tuning in yeah. wants to yeah. hear that. Mark, I'm wondering, Mark Rithmeyer, if, if Philip made the move from a great job into another great job, making a big bet, and he says now is the right time, you managed to convince some very smart and very wealthy people to invest in Alzheimer's drug development right now. Um, so they must think, and you must think, that this is the time. 
but there must still be barriers, just given what all the, the scientific difficulties that Philip outlined and, and the recency of biomarkers. What do you see, Mark, as the barriers to additional financial investment from the private sector? And what can we do about that? So um, a couple of things, and let me just go back and tag off on what Philip said, because I've heard so often Dr. Howard Phillip, who's a good friend of Phillip's, uh, and who co-founded the ADDF and is our chief science officer, you know, he often says, you know, Alzheimer's is right on time. And if you take a look at the history of just the last 30 or 40 years and how it was taught in medical schools, we're right on time. I think that the issue that starts coming up is how can we make it go faster? Right. And, and here I want to quote Michael Milken, who's had a lot to do with the cancer disease state. And he has spent some time um, looking at Alzheimer's, as have people like Bill Gates and Mackenzie Scott and, and uh, Jeff Bezos, and who are all uh, donors of ours. And Michael says it's not that there isn't enough money to do something about this, it's that the money is not lined up in the right places. And Russ, uh, I will say this for you and for our panelists and for, for, for the complete audience, um, the narrative is not right. Uh, for a whole host of reasons, the, the kind of mainstream media and the narrative gets caught up in, did Biogen's drug work? Did ASI's drug work? And now we're gonna hear about Roche's drug and we're gonna hear about Lily's drug, right? And it's all on you know, the plaques and tangles, the scab, that's made. And that is incredibly important. The fact that the scab can just be removed is incredibly important. The fact that the scab can be removed, and now we're showing some treatments like these last two drugs that seem to have some effect on cognition, how much for what person at the right time still to be determined, right, to happen. But that's a part of it, because those of us who work in this field, and, and there really is almost like a silent majority in the, in the scientific community, know the following. Prevention, combined therapies, precision medicines. So when we hear Philip talk about, you know, these two drugs that have come through that are taking away the scab, but you also hear him talk about these other pathways of aging and how if somebody has an inflammation issue, it's gonna be a combination. If somebody has a vascular issue, it's going to be a combination. And this is where, and I will let brighter minds than mine talk about the importance of biomarkers comes in and how you do that precision medicine comes in. So Russ, I will tell you that the narrative is off. And what happens with this narrative is that the way our ecosystem is around all of this we're almost forced to speak to this false narrative. What do I mean by that? These two drugs that just, one drug, Adam Helm got approval, Lacanonab that looks very interesting, we hope is gonna get approval. Two more that we think will look even more promising and hopefully get, get approved. Us against Alzheimer's. Of course we want those drugs to be paid for. Of course, of course, of course. But it is still a piece of this. It's not the combined that will ultimately come and will take care of issues for big numbers of people who now all of a sudden can remember their grandchildren's name, who now all of a sudden are, are gonna pass from something else but not being Alzheimer's. And that, so getting that story right is part of an issue. Um, uh, I know Russ, I've talked with you about this and I'll talk with others, with everyone here. Um, ADDF now going forward, we're gonna start working more aggressively with what we call the neurocurious VCs that are out there to explain to them where this is to hopefully bring their money in sooner. We're gonna look for strategic partnerships with the big pharmas. They view this biology of aging as a complementary strategy, right? Of course, they're myopically focused on their one molecule, as of course they would be. But it's not that they don't have an interest in this. And how do we bring pharma closer to this, right? That will do. The other thing, Russ, that I will say, and it's only because it's us against Alzheimer's and you all are brilliant. <clears throat> there was a reason in the 60s, 70s, the war on cancer happened. And the reason was is things were lining up that they thought, okay, this is the time now to take big, big pots of money and 
point of that exact things, right? This is, there's no question this is what's happening. There's no question over the last three years we've moved to that. The next three to five years are only going to move us there even faster. But it's not just Biogen's money. It's not just Lilly's money, right? It's not just Philip's money. It's not just the DDF's money. It's not, it needs to be better coordinated, better targeted, right? Sort of the, the false narrative. It's also the negativism that has been going around for many, many years. Nothing can work in Alzheimer's. It's a graveyard. And people start to believe this, and scientists start to believe this. And, and this is, look, that's why this, this Lekanamap is so important. It has to change the story. So it will attract more money. We need more money. There is still a fraction of the money in uh, put in Alzheimer's disease research than there is in cancer. So more money, but also more smart people that see a career in neuroscience doing research at the proper places. So it's a combination of those. And then, then, then the, the people outside, they said, well, yes, it can be done. And yes, you have to believe it, uh, that it is possible to create drugs for all these diseases. And that's why it's so important to emphasize that we have taken the, the curve here and that that's ADDF and DDF and all the people that Mark mentioned are, are crucial. Uh, in combination with all the governments to put more money into research and get more money to work in research uh, because we are we have to take the opportunity that we have a start now but we have to work on all these complex uh, sort of other mechanisms that Mark mentioned and and there are people out there and so the, the companies that we see hardly any of them works on amyloid purely they do on the inflammation pathway lysosomal storage issues, uh, uh, mitochondria, uh, gene therapies. There's a lot out there and, and it all needs to be developed, of course. I want to follow up on that in just a second, but I do want to let folks know if you're watching live, below where you're seeing us, there's a, there's a place where you can fill in a question for, the, uh, for the, this expert panel. Um, and if you have a question, fill that in and I will get to as many as I can in just a minute. I wanted to follow up on that the last sort of um, conversation since I've been in this field, it it felt like when I joined I was against Alzheimer's in 2019, the, the, there was a lot of depression. There's a lot of negative reports on drug development. And we've kind of been on this sort of roller coastery thing. But it also feels even among the scientists that that I spend time with at conferences, there was this hope, maybe even expectation that we're going to have penicillin for Alzheimer's or that we're going to have some kind of silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Philip, I'm wondering, you, you've spent your whole career in this in various aspects. Do you see a silver bullet? No, no, no. I, I think if we follow on of what Mark and I had said, I mean, there can't be a one silver bullet. I mean, there has to be several bullets actually at the same time, the combination therapy. And also one bullet may work for one person, but it may not work for the other one. So that's where the precision medicine comes in and targeted drugs for targeted sort of uh, uh, proteinopathies or targeted issues in the brain, I would say, just as we do as an oncology. It's not that different, actually. So when I grew up and you had lung cancer and there was only one therapy you gave, chemotherapy to everybody or radiation therapy. Now, we know that in this specific lung cancer, you have 35 different species and they're all treated differently. That will happen with the brain as well. We will get to know, using all the biomarkers, all the different elements in the brain that are sort of not working well, and we have to target medicines for each of them. And that will happen. Great. So I want to, a couple of you have talked about biomarkers um, and, and I wanted to ask about that because it, it seems like that is a big game changer in our field to have blood biome. I mean, it was a big change to have PET scans, right? So you, you can no longer have to diagnose the disease definitively on autopsy. You can diagnose it definitively with scans. They're, they're, they're hard to get. I mean, in, in the US, there are whole states where you have no option to get a PET scan and, and they're, they're yeah. more you can, <clears throat> difficult. But I wanted to ask about how you see the advent of blood-based and other sort of more easily determined biomarkers, not just on the sort of science, but also on, does that affect 
finances? Does it, does it affect people's willingness or ability? Does it shorten trials to the point where they're less expensive? What's the impact of, of biomarkers on the financial ecosystem? So if, if, I, if I may try to answer this one, I think, uh, yes. Uh, so the biomarkers have been crucial for, first of all, for diagnostic uh, purposes, but also to understand the disease processes, to follow them, to monitor them, to make prognostic uh, assumptions and to find out the target engagement of the drug. So the, the two drugs that were mentioned have a massive and, and, and enormous effect on lowering amyloid. And you can see this on the amyloid PET scan. So the so biomarkers have, have a definite role to play. The question that they are not available ready yet in for clinical utility is also because there has been no therapy. So it's a catch-22. So, so once the therapies will be out there, there will be the need to have MRI facilities, PET facilities, CSF uh, laboratories. There will be needing more doctors, more clinics actually working in this field. Otherwise, we can't handle all the patients. So uh, that will sort of ultimately work out as well. And the blood-based biomarkers, I think, are the, are the biggest revolution of the of the last three, four years, actually. And they will enable to stratify patients earlier on, to detect patients earlier on, to prevent patients undergoing expensive tests like PET. If the, you don't have the disease, you can actually skip that one. So the blood-based biomarkers can be used for sort of triage or sort of screening procedure at the first instance. And then you can select only those who have a positive biomarker, for instance, in blood. So that's why I see they actually can help reducing the cost of clinical trials and reducing the length of the of the inclusion period. Yeah, and Russ, I can add into that. Um, the blood-based biomarkers have already had a huge impact on mm -hmm. some of the clinical trials. So there's ability to, at a minimum, use them as a screening option to reduce the number of patients flowing in to the amyloid PET scans. So that is, um, we don't want that to be the primary reason that patients fail their screening for clinical mm -hmm. trials. So um, there have been uh, a number of trials that have already started to implement that. And um, there's also then hope as these blood-based biomarkers are being utilized more uh, in additional um, populations so that there can be an ability to understand how they behave in not the standard clinical trial patient, but in more and diverse populations. And on the flip side, I would say that um, it's not just blood biomarkers that we're excited about. Mm -hmm. There's the optical, so the retinal scans that are being developed the digital apps, all of these um, are investments that ADDF has made with our partners through the Diagnostic Accelerator. We expect that these also will be coming to fruition over a number of years where they can help not only with clinical trials, but also in screening patients in the real world to get them to their doctors to have that really important conversation um, that can then lead them to the ability to try some of these new medications that will be coming to the market. Laura, do they help? I'm going to go back to your one in 10,000. Do, does the advent of, of more easily obtained biomarkers help with that selection? Does that make it easier? And talk about it, how that if it does. Yes, in a number of ways. Um, for those that have been in the field for um, years, we know uh, that the first clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease, as Bill mentioned, um, were run in clinically diagnosed patients. So for some of the first um, anti-amyloid therapies, more than a third of the patients were included who did not actually have amyloid. So if you don't have amyloid in the brain, why would you treat with an anti-amyloid therapy? So at, at the first and foremost, getting the right patient into our clinical trials will reduce the cost and speed the development of the drugs. And then we know that there are not only amyloid and tau pathologies, but the other pathologies that we're talking about, whether it's neuroinflammation, so ADDF is helping to fund a number of very innovative 
um, researchers who are looking to try to identify biomarkers associated with neuroinflammation in the brain. So all of these will again help us to be able to um, study and develop these precision medicines. So we need precision clinical trials to be able to assess whether these more novel and biology of aging targets can be effective. Quickly, just one last little follow-up on the biomarkers question. Philip, we've, you've spent so much of your career on biomarkers, I, I, I hesitate to let you off without asking one more. So <laughs> you and Laura both talked about sort of biomarkers as a screener, as trying to make sure we've got the right population. They might shorten clinical trials by making sure that, that we're not wasting time in the recruitment of people who aren't actually there. But they're not at a point where we can do an Alzheimer's trial in six months because we can see a biomarker moving and know that that's gonna make a difference in clinical outcomes for patients. But we can do that with other diseases. Are we getting close? Oh, I disagree. I disagree. We can do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can do that. Mm -hmm. Especially in phase two, uh, biomarkers are already used to, to exactly to look at target engagement and, and hints of efficacy. And if there are none, if the if the base uh, blood-based biomarker or the PET amyloid imaging, tau imaging doesn't move or move the other right direction, you can actually stop the, the development of the drug. So it's really helpful to kill the darlings that were otherwise wouldn't have been killed and would have taken a longer time to prove them unuseful in phase three. So yes, I think we will get there, as in the MS field, for instance, also that we first of all look at the biomarker as a signal of efficacy or not uh, and we can use that as a proxy as a surrogate marker for efficacy that was actually for me also the the, the vision that the fda had in approving aducanumab whatever you think of it they had a vision that that a, a move in the biomarker is actually predictive of a clinical effect later on and that's actually very very sort of uh, exactly to the point and i think we can do this with more sensitive biomarkers earlier on. So PTAU is a good example. There are some companies there that are testing drugs at the moment where you see already a shift in PTAU in six months. So, and if that is sort of proves also to be a clinically useful drug, then we are there. Fantastic. Let me ask the panel real quickly about um, the ultimate, I guess, silver bullet isn't really penicillin for Alzheimer's. It's a vaccine for Alzheimer's. How, what needs to happen to get us there? How optimistic are you that we're there if we get back together in 10 years? I'll start with Laura. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, again, I think I would reframe that to think about mm -hmm. vaccines. So we, we know that it's not a single pathology that is um, uh, really underlying Alzheimer's. And I think that we need to look at this disease as, um, as we've talked about, it's the biology of aging. So there are multiple um, antecedents, so multiple causes, multiple pathologies associated with Alzheimer's disease. So I do have hope that there will be huge strides towards um, both the understanding and the development of drugs and bringing those drugs to market. Um, so that's where I would put our hope. So Philip, what do you think in your 10 year horizon for your fund? Is there is there a, a vaccine for some form of Alzheimer's? I think so, yes. So basically what has been developed now is, is passive immunization, so monoclonal antibodies that you have to in inject. But uh, the, the other side of that is actually active immunization with a vaccine. And uh, companies are working that on tau and, and also working on amyloid vaccines. So yes, I think that's actually a very clever way to do that. We had some, some so the very first vaccine that was developed uh, had a lot of side effects, but it was actually the wrong vaccine that had a massive sort of uh, immune reaction, but we know now how it came about. So I think the next sort of generation of vaccines will be cleverly developed. And I also would pitch in for gene therapy. We're, we're getting there as well. Probably not for Alzheimer's disease to start with, but for the more rare forms of genetic uh, uh, FTD, for instance, gene therapy may be an option. And in 10 years time, we will see some of those therapies come to life, yes. So my last question actually relates to what you were just saying, Philip. 
but let's let's say that we're getting back together again in five years, which would be fantastic to have the same panel together in five years. Where do you think what what will be the big advances? I think Philip you just named one or two, but in five years, what what are the big advances, and what will that mean for investment in the field? I'll start with you, Philip, and and then Laura, and then close it out with Mark. So I think so. The investments in the field are already picking up because of the the successes that we just mentioned, and I think it will grow. People will will come to understand that neurology and neuroscience is the next big thing uh, after oncology. So we have to invest in it, otherwise we we have no future anymore. So I think that's that's we'll, in five years' time we'll see how that has played out. But I also think that in five years' time we'll have of the of the the drugs that are now being developed in the late stage we'll have. Uh, ways of administration like an oral formula or a subcutaneous formula so easier ways and less burdensome and also less costly for the patient and for the society uh, sort of building on the themes that we are now discussing thanks laura and what i would add to that is you know we we will see the anti-amyloid therapies available um as philip mentioned i think some of these will begin to be available with um more easily uh, accessible formulations, subcutaneous, et cetera. But on top of that, what we're going to start to see are the combination therapies. So adding on, use it to some of these other um, aspects of the biology of aging, bringing these forward and close to market so that we can um, look for greater efficacy. It will be able to slow the progression um, because we'll be coming at it from multiple angles. So this will really be where we're headed. And then ultimately using those biomarkers to identify which of the therapies that should be used for the individual patients. Mark, bring us home. I, I, not leaving a lot of breathing room on those. They're well answered. Uh, you know, Right. almost in reverse order to what, what Laura just said. Um, first of all, more and better biomarkers. And if you want to know, you're going to be able to more, much more easily find out. No, it could be going for an eye scan to your op op ophthalmologist, right? And, and that, Russ, if you think about it, that's mind blowing in and of itself because that brings up all sorts of things, right? But more and better biomarkers, uh, better amyloid results, and we're going to be seeing our first diverse targets starting to green shoot through the ground of, oh, there's promise on inflammation. Oh, there's promise on vascular that's going on. And, and Russ, I, I'm so happy that the two doctors spoke to this first because they said the same thing. This is not like crazy thinking. This is like it's right in front of us right now. I mean, really, the pressure's on folks like Philip and folks like ADDF and folks like DDF. How fast can we move this? But we need partners in this narrative. I mean, what the, the real narrative is, because Milken wasn't wrong. It's, it, you know, money can speed science. There's a lot of money out there. But if you think about those billions that are going into very singular things, if some of that was coming into these diverse targets, the whole field would move faster. Thank you all. Thank you to the panel. Three visionaries and brilliant folks on and thinking about what's it going to take for all of us to get a, a combination of therapies to treat what is no doubt a proliferation of subtypes of Alzheimer's disease. Up next, Senator Susan Collins interviewing with George Vradenberg. Senator Collins, one of the early visionaries in the political leadership to bring funding for Alzheimer's to where it is today. Thanks for joining us.